so thanks very much, Andrew, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really delighted to uh, once again be speaking at the Scottish Land Commission's uh, conference, the second conference since the establishment of the Land Commission in 2017. Um, since then, I think the Commission has gone from strength to strength. It's built a reputation as an authoritative and credible voice, and I think it's uh, achieved what we all hoped would happen uh, with the Land Commission. It is, it is thinking out of the box. It is, uh, it is certainly challenging, um, and, uh, and I think it's become a really serious and important voice uh, on not just uh, the scene in terms of land reform, but in a much wider sense as well. It's examined a huge range of issues related to land. Um, obviously, uh, uh, that will include how land is owned, managed and used, and the effects that arise from that pattern of land ownership, management and use. So there's been reports on topics such as community ownership, land value capture, vacant and derelict land, and scale and concentration of ownership. And that's helped illustrate, I think, the fundamental importance of land across the whole of Scotland, and it shapes our thinking around how we address uh, these issues. Since its creation, the Commission, I think, has worked tirelessly to promote best practice amongst those who do own and manage land, helping to ensure that the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement is at the root of all decisions that are made about land. The Commission's ongoing engagement with landowners and communities is crucial in helping us understand the impact of our collective efforts, as well as identifying ways to bring about the long-lasting changes that will deliver our ambitions for land. And that engagement uh, with communities, the length and breadth of Scotland, I think is one of the striking features of the way the Land Commission does operate. That activity, along with the recommendations made by uh, the Commission in its various reports, are pointing the way forward for land reform and my officials are working with the, com the Commission to, to consider how these can be developed and implemented as policy. Land reform isn't something that has been done, and there's a full stop put at the end of it. Land reform continues to be a process that I think this government and future governments in Scotland will always want to be working on and improving and changing. So I think that's important for us to, to understand that. I value very highly the, commission, uh, the work the Commission does, and I do look forward to the next steps in the shared journey. Now, the theme of today's conference is inclusive growth, and uh, you'll have several speakers talking about specific ways in which we're bringing about the circumstances to ensure that land does support inclusive, sustainable growth. I remain firmly of the view that the way in which land is used and managed, and perhaps most importantly, how it is owned, is fundamental to supporting that aspiration. My vision for land reform set out in the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement talks about all land contributing to a modern and successful country. And perhaps the biggest barrier to achieving that is Scotland's distorted pattern of land ownership. As we know all too well, the pattern of land ownership in Scotland has always been unbalanced, skewed in favour of a very small number of people who own a disproportionately large amount of land. It is vital that we correct that imbalance. And as long as so much of our land remains owned by a rel relatively small number of people, the benefits of land will never be shared fully or fairly. The Commission's work on scale and concentration of ownership found that monopolies can arise where there is concentrated ownership, such monopolies often act against the public interest. And that may not be a deliberate act against the public interest. It is simply by virtue of being that kind of monopoly that the public interest is negatively impacted. Concentrated land ownership and the associated monopolies of power are one of the most obvious ways in which inclusive growth is hampered. When control and influence over large amounts of land is concentrated in the hands of a small number of people, the potential of that land to support wider economic, social and environmental outcomes is greatly reduced. And that is a theme that will be addressed by a number of speakers today. Concentrated ownership patterns create an uneven geography of land availability. In particular parts of Scotland, land ownership is so concentrated that it is stifling growth and opportunity. Without a steady flow of land coming into the market, housing supply is limited. 
opportunity to own land is quashed and the ability of people to influence the use and management of land is undermined. The Commission's work on scale and concentration of ownership is at the forefront of the land reform agenda and addressing it will need radical action that not everyone will be comfortable with. And one of the key recommendations is the introduction of a public interest test so that certain proposed sales would need to be shown to be in the public interest before they could take place. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done to develop policy proposals, but a public interest test does have the potential to guard against power being further concentrated where it is likely to have a negative effect. It is the kind of mechanism we've got to consider seriously if we are to bring about a fairer and more productive relationship with Scotland's land. Given Scotland's historical patterns of land ownership, it could be a powerful and radical idea. It is worth noting, however, that many other countries have well-established controls over who can own land and what they can do with it. In that sense, the introduction of a public interest test wouldn't be particularly unusual. We must take strong action to address patterns of land ownership, and I'm not going to shy away from options that can transform how land is owned and used across Scotland. Now, there are other ways that current patterns of land use and ownership undermine our efforts to support inclusive growth. One of the most frustrating is the large amount of land not being used productively. For over 30 years, we've been recording the amount of vacant and derelict land in Scotland, and in that time, the area of land on the register has remained almost static. Whenever land is removed from the register, it's replaced by other land that has fallen into this category, and we seem to have got stuck at around 11,000 hectares of vacant and derelict land uh, for years. That just seems to be now a static figure. And that is clearly not good enough. It is land that is contributing nothing to Scotland, and in many cases has a negative impact on those who live close to it. A disproportionate amount of vacant and derelict land is situated near deprived communities. Instead of helping such communities to tackle the problems they face, it worsens the situation and is completely contrary to what we are trying to achieve. So we have to do better on that. Now, we did establish the Vacant and Derelict Land Task Force in 2018 to seek permanent solutions to this problem, a problem that has blighted Scotland for far too long. The task force brings together a range of experts from business, the third sector, and the public sector. It is developing a more strategic way to identify opportunities to bring vacant and derelict land into productive use in ways that support inclusive growth. And the task force is chaired by Steve Dunlop of Scottish Enterprise. Steve is speaking next, so I'll leave him to talk about the work of the task force in detail. However, its work is vital to combating a problem that is emblematic of the way that unproductive land actively undermines our, our efforts to promote inclusive growth. Inclusive growth and fairness do remain key themes for the Scottish Government, and that is reflected in this year's programme for government. But the PFG also reflects the urgent need to take action to combat climate change. And we all have responsibility to make sure that land contributes to that fight as well. In May this year, I made a statement to the Scottish Parliament in which I said that there was irrefutable evidence that there is a climate emergency. That language, I think, now has become fairly uh, embedded in uh, people's understandings. The need for immediate and far-reaching action is beyond doubt, and the way in which land is owned, managed and used has a major role to play. The PFG makes a number of commitments about how we will use land to support our climate change ambitions, but I would urge everybody here, if they haven't done so, to go and have a look at the report of the Committee on Climate Change, who made their recommendations to us about targets, and specifically their reasons why they gave Scotland a target of 2045 for net zero emissions, as opposed to the UK as a whole having a target of 2050. And the principal reason for that is our land and the nature of our land. So if anybody's under any illusions about how important Scotland's land is to climate change, have a look at those sections of the Committee on Climate Change's report, and you will begin to understand in a crystal clear fashion 
why uh, uh, we have to think very carefully about land use now. So actually, this is really an important new emphasis for our approach to land. The land reform debate hasn't really been couched in those terms in the past, but we need to think about it now. We've always recognised that land can help to protect and enhance the environment, and this is embedded in the principles of the land rights and responsibility statements. Uh, statement, but the climate emergency means that we must now proactively seek ways to tackle climate change through the use, management and ownership of land. And we've used the PFG to make a number of new commitments about how land will contribute to responding to the climate emergency. So during the next year we will develop proposals for how regional partnerships and frameworks can be implemented with the intention that regional partnerships are in place by 2021. By 2023, I expect that each partnership will have developed its own regional land use framework that sets out where resources can have most impact in tackling climate change. And this will require considerable discussion across a range of organisations to ensure that partnerships are as effective as possible. The phased approach set out in the PFG will help us to get this right, but it's important that we don't lose momentum. I did accept amendments at stage three of the climate change bill, which require ministers to report annually on the progress being made in implementing the land use strategy as a whole, as well as requiring the climate change plan, which I'm now going to have to embark on as a result of the legislation. So for the next six months or so, uh, uh, that will be the consuming part of the debate. So the climate change plan will have to include proposals and policies for establishing regional land use partnerships and frameworks. We've also committed to reviewing the land use strategy and the land rights and responsibilities statement to ensure that they both support our climate change ambitions. And together, the strategy and the statement underpin our approach to land in its very broadest sense. Both already recognise the importance of land in protecting the environment and tackling climate change. Indeed, the land use strategy is a product of the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009, which people may have forgotten about. However, it's the right time to take a fresh look at both the strategy and the land rights and responsibilities statement um, that, so to make sure that we recognise and take every opportunity to tackle climate change through the way in which uh, land is used, owned and managed. My officials and the Commission will be working together to ensure that the strategy and the statement fully support our climate change ambitions. I've already mentioned the contribution that our work on vacant and derelict land can make to inclusive growth. It can also make an important contribution to tackling climate change, for example, through identifying sites that can be used for example, for tree planting and other forms of carbon sequestration. The programme for government commits us to consider any recommendations made by the vacant and derelict land task force. And that's a prime opportunity for us to permanently reduce the amount of vacant and derelict land in Scotland and to think innovatively about bringing it back into productive use. It is vital that we do ensure that our thinking about land is done in the context of climate change, both to allow us to take action quickly, but also to make sure that we can put in place meaningful long-term solutions. PFG provides important impetus to do just that and will mean that we need to think about land in new ways. There are existing work streams that remain important. Those are uh, some of the pre-existing work streams and the programme for government ensures that our commitment to our broader land reform agenda continues to have momentum. We've committed to providing 10 million pounds for the Scottish Land Fund each year until 2021. The Land Fund is a vital source of funding for communities and we have seen a year on year increase in the amount of funding it has actually awarded. And we will continue to develop the register of persons holding a controlled interest in land so that it is in force by 2021. Um, those regulations are in Parliament at the moment, going through the, uh, uh, the process that is required, um, and uh, uh, that will be continuing to happen over the coming months. And this will be an important step in further increasing transparency about who is making decisions about land. We will introduce a further community right to buy in 2020, which will allow communities to acquire land where their proposed use of the land 
will support sustainable development more than its existing use. And that's a potentially transformative power which could underpin our efforts to make sure that land is used productively. Because it is a compulsory sale, communities will be required to build a strong case, but I believe this new power will help communities to take ownership of land and ensure it is used for their long-term benefit. It is an important signal that we cannot allow land to be used in an unproductive or unsustainable way. And of course, that will have, I hope, a positive impact on current landowners who may begin to have to think about the way they are using their land and ensure that uh, it is used in a sustainable way for the future. The PFG also commits us to hosting an international land reform conference. Many countries are grappling with land issues, but Scotland's situation often goes unnoticed internationally, and I had an example of it last week. I was speaking to the Maltese uh, environment minister who was on a visit to Scotland, um, and he was curious about the land reform part of the title of my cabinet responsibilities because they have a problem about land ownership in Malta. He was not aware of the land reform legislation in Scotland. He was not aware of what we had done. Crucially for him, he wasn't aware, of course, that everything we have done is fully in accordance with EU rules. That's, you know, we're heading for the exit door, allegedly. Malta isn't. And I'm saying to him, well, we have a ready-made template for you to have a look at that you know is utterly compliant with, uh, with all the EU rules that you will need. Now, he didn't know about Scotland's land reform legislation. So I think it's really important that we help to be part of that international land reform debate. Um, and because other countries are grappling with land issues, we can also learn from them in developing policy and considering how we might address some of our deep-seated problems, we do often look to other countries uh, uh, who have responded to similar problems. So it is important we learn from them. But our unique set of challenges, and because we're an outward-looking country, and because we are regarded as a first-world country, uh, so there's a certain amount of bemusement about a land reform debate in a first-world country, until they find out about the land ownership patterns, of course, and then, of course, people can actually see what the problem is. But that puts us in a, a unique position, I think, in terms of this international uh, debate. So we've got a lot to contribute to global thinking about land and how it can be used fairly and equitably to support different outcomes. So um, that land reform conference it will bring people from uh, all across the world it will be an opportunity to draw on experience, but also to demonstrate how our approach to land reform could help address situations elsewhere. Land is fundamental to many of our ambitions for a better Scotland, and the next year gives us the opportunity to make significant steps in tackling particular problems, as I've talked about particularly in relation to climate change. So today I have focused on inclusive growth and how we respond to the climate change challenge and the way in which land can either support our aspirations or hinder them. But as well as committing us to particular activity for specific purposes, our PFG Programme for Government recognises the way land can support a wide range of outcomes, and I think that is something that is worth emphasising. We want to tackle the amount of vacant and derelict land, and that will have a positive impact on poverty and climate change. It will support our efforts to regenerate post-industrial Scotland. We want to encourage more communities to own land, and that will strengthen those communities and help to reduce the concentration of land ownership. We want to ensure that land contributes to how we tackle climate change, and that will have implications for diversifying ownership, which in turn will support more productive use of land. And this illustrates the way that decisions about land cause ripples that can be felt across the whole country, often for many years. It reminds us that the way in which land is used, what it is used for, and who owns it are all crucial to the long-term well-being and prosperity of Scotland. So we must always bear in mind the role of land in addressing many of Scotland's most pressing issues so that we can ensure that the benefits of land are felt fairly across Scotland for this and future generations. Thank you.
Minister, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, some very clear, very strong messages there. Nobody can be in any doubt at all. I'm looking forward to going to Malta to tell them about uh, land reform. That'll be fun. Um, of course, I'll cycle and sail <laughs> to get there as part of uh, the Land Commissioner's leadership role on uh, zero carbon uh, uh, emissions. Um, now, the Cabinet Secretary has very kindly agreed to, to stay for a, a short time and answer uh, questions. Could I ask you please to say who you are and what your interest is? And could I ask you please to ask a question, not launch a manifesto? <laughs> Good luck with that, Andrew. <laughs> so you'll see I haven't brought up any uh, um, notes and what have you. If your question is very technical and detailed, I may ask to take a note of your name and the issue and we will have to get back to you because I haven't arrived with a whole set of very specific Q&A briefs. Are you Definitely doing it, Andrew? Here. Yeah. There's a microphone. Oh, Thanks, Rosanna. Uh, Rosanna, you didn't mention anything about um, land as a source of public revenue. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> I know. Uh, but surely, you know, as that debate develops, it's important that all people, whether in government or elsewhere, uh, considering the different uses for land, also consider how that use or how. Uh, a land value taxation or equivalent could impact on the actual use of that land going forward? Um, I, there would be quite a lot of things that I wouldn't, you know, have discussed. That, you know, I was trying to focus the speech particularly on the, uh, on, on the, on the subject for the, uh, um, for the annual conference. Um, uh, yes, I'm obviously very well aware of the debate around that. Um, uh, it won't be a decision um, that I make as an individual in terms of my cabinet responsibilities is a decision that it will effectively be, would have to be made by the whole of government. Um, we have been looking at it um, and I think there's probably a bit of a debate going on because um, my understanding of it is that it, it doesn't necessarily do everything that people think it does in practice. So it, it isn't, you know, from, from our perspective, it isn't just the obvious uh, um, uh, uh, kind of answer to all the problems that, that exist. Um, it is one part of potentially an answer, but it doesn't necessarily in and of itself fix all the issues around, uh, um, around it. I, I understand where people are coming from, however, and have a lot of sympathy for it, but it, it, often what happens in government is when you begin to look at the detail of how you would begin to implement it, some real issues emerge that perhaps, perhaps haven't been thought about. But I expect this is a conversation that will continue. Uh, and it's not one that in government we're not conscious of, aware of, and looking at, I can promise you. Okay, thank you very much. Next one. <coughs> okay. one up at the back. Uh, right. in of, just in front of Peter. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Really great speech. This is Mila Duncheva from Edinburgh Napier University. I was wondering, when you talk about productive use of land and economic development, what, do you know what kinds of measures you use to measure the productivity of the land or what kinds of units? How can you compare the productive use of one piece of plot to another? <laughs> well, um, um, one might argue that almost any use of formerly vacant and derelict land is going to be an increase in, in, in productive use. Um, if there is a technical measurement that you're looking for, um, I will ask about whether or not we do have that. I don't... Hamish, okay. mate. Hamish. I mean, I, I don't know whether there are very technical measurements. I, I suppose I would look at it um, a, a bit from the perspective of a layperson, um, in the sense that if I see um, a piece of land which at the moment is doing absolutely nothing, and it could be quite a large bit of land, and the community comes along, uh, takes ownership of it, and then there's, a, say, a single wind turbine producing renewable energy, then, then you know, for me, that is the kind of thing that you might think of. And, of course, that has precisely what's happened in a lot of, in, in a lot of places. Um, uh, if you're talking about uh, a piece of land in the inner city, you're probably not necessarily going to have a turbine on it, although... You know, even there, it might happen. Um, but there will be other um, quite uh, productive uses of it that are perhaps a little harder to capture because actually just creating a community hub is in and of itself um, productive and, and has an impact. So if you're looking for very technical measurements, I'll make sure that 
we can get from within the Land Commission if they've got a very technical way of doing it. Uh, I would tend to look at it uh, in a much more uh, uh, subjective way and say, you kind of know it when you see it. Thank you very much. That really helps Thank to understand you. things. The gentleman there, just in front of you there, please. Um, Vicky Swells, RSPB Scotland. Um, thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. It was fantastic to um, hear your support for um, regional partnerships and the regional land use framework, something we've been very supportive mm. of as of Scottish Environment Link. I wonder, would you agree that you would see local authorities as playing a lead part in the formation of those partnerships? And I guess the trickier question is, <laughs> would government uh, commit to providing some funding for the formation <laughs> of those partnerships to Ooh. make sure that they can re really effectively do exactly what you set out, because I think they can unlock a huge amount of um, our thinking going forward. I think it will almost certainly involve some money. I don't think I can avoid that. I don't have an enormous budget. Um, I, I think anybody who's very much involved with the way government works will know when they look at my budget that most of my budget's about paying staff and, and, and resources, and I don't have a huge discretionary budget. But I do have a little bit of money and we can begin to, I think, have a look at whether or not that can be helpfully used. Yes, I think local authorities um, uh, are an important uh, part of any of these conversations, not least of, because many of them are significant landowners themselves. Um, uh, and, you know, it's not just that the local authority um, is also making a lot of other decisions about land, it is that they are often landowners. Um, so it would be difficult to imagine regional land use partnerships that didn't have some involvement for local authorities. Of course, some local authorities will be keener than others, which is another issue. Um, uh, and uh, I would hope that all local authorities were prepared to at least be engaged in this conversation. Um, we're going to have to work quite hard, quite quickly, in order to, uh, in order to do it in the timescale that we've talked about. Um, but it will be interesting to see the net results of it, I think, um, uh, because one of our big problems is uh, a, a bigger demographic issue that looks like areas of depopulation developing and not being fixed, and also this strange drift from west to east in Scotland. So, speaking as somebody whose roots are in the west, I'm a little bit kind of... <laughs> worried about that. <laughs> so, you know, there are, some, there are some very distinctive regional issues which I think will arise. One of the slight issues I have is that there are some regions in Scotland who may not really feel that this is something that's a big deal for them, and it's making sure that every part of Scotland gets covered is going to be important. While you're there, Callum, please, next to you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Callum McLeod, Policy Director of Community Land Scotland. Um, Cabinet Secretary, really heartened and encouraged by your very strong endorsement of the relationship between community ownership mm. uh, of, 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 sorry, ownership of, of, of land, its use and its management. That seems to be a very clear and unambiguous message. And also the fact that you mentioned that some of the measures may not be comfortable for all. I think if we're doing land reform that's comfortable, we might be doing it wrong. I, I, I just <laughs> wanted to, to ask you... Um, in terms of a, the urban context, how significant do you see community ownership as being in, in terms of promoting that kind of inclusive growth that you've very much encouraged and, and, and wish to pursue uh, in terms of the policy agenda? Um, I, I think community ownership in Scotland has been a phenomenal success, and I think that in most uh, parts of Scotland, and uh, you know, this historically has been more of a rural thing, uh, um, that inclusive growth and sustainable development has been embedded right at the start. So um, the, the issue, I think, uh, psychologically in urban Scotland is getting people to think in terms of this being part of a land reform agenda. They don't necessarily engage with it in that way. Although in general terms, I have to say that mostly when I see it happening at the moment it, the, in, in urban areas, it arises out of um, a feeling of a community um, having lost or, or uh, something or uh, uh, being deprived of something or needing that community. So the inclusive growth is almost, although not perhaps used in those terms, 
is, is almost a driver for, for, the, for the community deciding that they will want to take over something or, or, or whatever. Um, um, so it's almost like embedded in it. Um, uh, historically, in rural terms, it probably wasn't in just quite that same, it, same way. It was more overt, I think, in rural areas because of what had been happening for you know, many decades, if not centuries. I think in urban Scotland, it is embedded and they're not really using that terminology or, or, or thinking about it, but it is the driver in a, in a different way. Um, so it's really important, I think, uh, uh, that in urban Scotland, we, um, we ensure that the, and it is always a danger, and I have to be really careful how I couch this now. Um, it, there is always a danger that this becomes something that in, in, in better off, more affluent areas, people who are, of course, um, perhaps uh, more savvy um, can, can use this. Uh, and I wouldn't want to not incentivize that. I, you know, for me, community land ownership, wherever it happens and however it happens and why ever it happens is a good thing. Um, but we need to make sure that in those communities that will actually benefit the most, we get that message across. And that's the tricky thing, because that's actually the, the harder thing, because you're, you're talking about in community empowerment um, and, and communities that don't feel empowered won't feel that they have the capacity to do this, and that's a big hurdle that we've got to overcome in most communities. Um, uh, so it, it, it is a tricky one, but I think it is, it is an argument we are winning in Scotland. And let's be honest, the existence of the land fund kind of helps a lot. <laughs> it's sort of when people know that they can apply to a land fund to get the funding for what they're doing. It's one of the few areas of public policy where, where that can be an easy option just now. It's, you know, we're not in a great time financially. So the land reform agenda is very precious in the sense that it does have that dedicated funding behind it, which I think makes all the difference. Thank you. One or two more. I, I, I would ask, please, to, if you put your hands up, if you've got a question about a different subject, I'm conscious that you probably want to talk about the same thing that's just been raised. Uh, <laughs> what about the man at the back? Thanks. John Hollingdale, CWA. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation, for the reasons given already. You spoke about the importance of ensuring um, fairness in the distribution of the benefits that flow from land ownership. A lot of those benefits actually flow from government, from the, the fiscal and other sort of financial regimes that the government has in place, Scottish government and in some cases UK government. Um, will the Scottish government do more to ensure that in future its um, flows of finance uh, to the land sector actually help deliver this fairness across Scotland? We will always try and do what we can do. I, I think one of the things that people need to understand about government is that we, and I don't want to draw comparisons with other governments that might exist in the UK, but other governments are available. Um, governments are expected to um, operate within the law. Um, and ours is no different to that. Um, and sometimes um, that creates uh, some issues that are difficult ones for us to manage. So um, within the context of what we can do legally, and people aren't necessarily always aware of what that constraint might look like, um, we will always try and do what, what we can. And there was an interesting discussion yesterday about some issues around this. I had a meeting yesterday of all of the um, chairs and chief executives of the public sector bodies that sit within my portfolio remit. Um, and that issue that you've raised was precisely one of the ones that uh, uh, was being discussed. Um, and you know there are some technical kind of issues and barriers that would need to be thought very clearly about before we went too far down a road without getting ourselves into bother. Um, and as I said, um, we have, uh, as a government, uh, always felt that it was uh, part of our job to work within the law. Um, and occasionally, 
be prepared to have that law tested in court, indeed, um, but nevertheless to, uh, uh, to be abiding by the law. As I said, other governments are available. <laughs> okay, let's have one more, please, uh, preferably on a subject that we haven't heard a question on. Anyone wanting to? I know what we're going to get from here. That's <laughs> Maybe at the back. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, Alison Martin from the University of the Highlands and Islands. I was pleased to see the connection with um, climate change emergency and the way that's being built into the land reform um, agenda and process. I guess the, the question is, so there's that sitting at one side and I noticed some of the talks today in Andrew's um, introduction at the beginning discussed economic growth and in particular accelerating economic growth. What degree of discussion is there, government level, about the fact that these things may be difficult bedfellows and difficult to reconcile? I think uh, uh, this is a this is a kind of balance that we are always trying to strike. Um, no government is going to want to uh, produce a situation where um, folk are worse off, uh, um, where job op opportunities decrease. Um, um, these are not good uh, circumstances for any people um, and we don't want that to be the case in Scotland either. But I do also point to the fact that Scotland uh, um, uh, is one of the very few countries in the world to have made uh, so far very good inroads into our emissions reduction targets. We nearly, uh, we've, we've nearly reduced our emissions by half since the global 1990 baseline. And we have done that at the same time as we are able to make sure that unemployment decreases uh, and that there is economic growth. But I suppose it depends on uh, uh, how you define economic growth, uh, which is a big discussion. Um, but secondly, it is also about uh, having a discussion about climate change that talks about the opportunities and not just the uh, um, uh, the costs. Uh, people are very keen to talk about costs when it comes to climate change. Costs either financial or costs in, in disappearing industries and all the rest of it. Um, the point about our Just Transition Commission is to have that discussion constantly with all sectors of society um, because there are enormous opportunities as well. Um, so I, I, would, I would rather talk about balance than uh, as if it was only ever going to be one thing or the other. Um, uh, and I'm happy to have that discussion and debate in, in a longer sense in a, different for, in a different forum. Great, thank you very much. I think we'll probably call it a day okay. at that, if that's okay, okay. thank you. So can, can I ask you please just to say thank you very, very much again.